Well, good morning and welcome everyone today for our service. And uh, thank you for tuning in today, the viewing online. We always glad for you to join us on a Sunday morning for our worship time, as well as to learn from the Word of God. And so I want to invite you today to take your Bible and go with Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. I'm very excited to begin a new series of study leading all the way up to Easter Sunday, which this is just a few weeks away. And um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the wonders of the cross. And man, this is going to be a great series. I pray you'll be richly blessed as much as I have in studying and preparing these messages for you. So from Matthew 27, we're going to begin to read in verse 38, and we'll follow the reading that God's holy, inspired, and errant, infallible word with prayer. The Bible says, that the, Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he's the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I'm the son of God. Now listen to verse 34. Even the robbers who were crucified with him, speaking to one on the right and one on the left, reviled him with the same thing. Let's pray. God, our Father in heaven, ask again, O God, that you put your thoughts in my mind, your words in my mouth, fill me with the Holy Spirit, empower me to preach your truth with boldness and clarity of speech. May every heart that hears this word, Lord, hear from you today. And you speak as you see fit, and may your will be done for your power and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm sure you all have heard about the famous ancient things and places that is often called the wonders of the world. Um, you know, the Taj Mahal is one of the great wonders of the world. Uh, the Great Wall of China is the great one, one of the wonders of the world. And, of course, the pyramids of Egypt and many other places that are known as wonders of the world. But I'm going to be preaching for the next few weeks on the wonders of the cross. Um, and I, like I said, I'm going to finish it on Easter Sunday morning. But think about this. When our Lord Jesus Christ died on that old rugged cross some 2,000 years ago, he set in motion a series of events as well as a series of wonders, some supernatural happenings that all commenced the moment that he was nailed to that old rugged cross. And I just believe that we... As born-again believers in Christ must constantly lift up the cross in the local church. Because the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I would boast in anything but the cross of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When Paul was going to preach to that sophisticated cosmopolitan metropolis of uh, Corinth, that secular godless city, he said, when I came to you people in Corinth, I want, I, came, I want you to know I came to know nothing among you. I came to preach nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why is that? Because you see, a fresh vision of the cross inspires the worship of the believer. A fresh vision of the cross motivates the believer to a holy walk and to have enthusiasm in our Christian service. A fresh vision of the cross, I personally believe, like nothing else, stirs up revival fires in the local New Testament church and keeps them burning. And so the first wonder we want to look at in Matthew 27, which will be our text for the next few weeks now, as we see Jesus on the cross, the first one we want to look at is the wonder of a changed life. The wonder of a changed life. The scripture says when Jesus was being crucified that there were two thieves being crucified, crucified beside him. One on the left, one on the right. So there were three in number on that day on that hill called Golgotha, the place called the skull that we call Calvary. There was two men being crucif crucified beside Jesus. Now we know the man in the middle, Jesus himself, was innocent of all the charges that were brought against him. But the two being crucified, crucified beside him were guilty of their crimes. Those two men had been uh, um, um, tried by the courts in that day. They had been found guilty of robbing, guilty of being thieves, guilty of just being rebels and outlaws and troublemakers and treasonous, just hard, uh, unbelieving hearts. 
and they were also being crucified on each side of the Lord of glory. So get that picture in your mind. They took the tortured body of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was innocent, and with those rusty Roman spikes, they nailed his hands and feet to that cross, lifting him up, suspended between heaven and hell, and positioned him between two common, murderous, low-life thieves. Well, one of those convicted thieves, in particular, heard Jesus say something that forever changed his life. And so I want you to notice three things about that thief who experienced the wonder of a changed life just before it was too late. First of all, I want to say something about his condition. His condition. Now, at first, he was obviously a lost and dying sinner who was making fun of Jesus. Verse 44 says, even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. In other words, the two robbers were mocking Jesus with the same words that the people in that crowd were using towards Jesus. The scripture says very specifically, Jesus Christ was being crucified among two convicted robbers who were reviling against him. Which, by the way, that was fulfilled prophecy. Over in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, in chapter 53, verse 12, the Bible says that Jesus would be uh, numbered with the transgressors. In Mark's account of this story, in Mark's gospel, chapter 15, he actually quoted the words of the prophet Isaiah to indicate that the scriptures were fulfilled at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So I want you to think about that. 700 years before this ever took place, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, through a spirit of prophecy, Isaiah the prophet predicted that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would be numbered with the transgressors. So I just want to proclaim it again, just in case you may have missed this over the years since you've known me. The cross of Jesus Christ was not God's plan B. It was God's plan A all along. I mean, you, you take a football game, you know, and a, a team will come to a place in time where they may have to punt. But a cross was not God punting. I'm telling you, this scene at the cross was exactly the mission of Jesus Christ that was foreordained and predetermined before this world was ever made. Jesus himself testified to, to that truth, saying the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. And so when I think about the fact that my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ willingly left the hallways of glory to come to this sin-cursed earth in a body of flesh and blood for one main reason, to die for me, to die for you, to hang on that cross, to bear our sins on his body, to pay our sin debt in full once and for all. Just the thought of his love for us to do that in our place amazes me, and I'm overwhelmed with the wonder of all that happened on the cross on that day almost 2,000 years ago. Now, I don't know if I'll ever see any wonders of the world in my lifetime or not, other than by maybe some pictures that I see in a book or maybe on some uh, uh, TV show or something. But, uh, and I'm sure that those wonders of the world are amazing things to see. I, I don't doubt that. But I'm going to tell you what. There's nothing in this world that will ever compare to the wonder of the cross. I want to tell you what really blows my mind and really blesses my socks off more than anything else is that Jesus Christ, according to the divine plan of God Almighty, came to this earth with me on his mind. He died with my sins um, bearing down on him as he was taking my curse that I deserved in my place as my substitute. He's the one who shed his blood for me to satisfy the wrath of God that was against me because of sin. And he did that in order for me to experience the wonder of a changed life. Oh, I'm thankful for the wonder of the cross. Hallelujah. Well, the Bible says there was one thief on the left, one thief on the right of Jesus, two convicted robbers, and the Lord Jesus who knew, knew no sin. He was being uh, crucified in between these two evil men. And at the beginning, both of these robbers, both of them were hurling insults towards Jesus. Verse 44, Matthew 27 said, even the robbers who were crucified reviled him with the same thing. In other words, they picked up all the mockings and the reviling that was coming from the crowd. The robbers just joined right in and started doing that towards Jesus. Think about that. The crowds were hurling insults to Jesus hanging there on that cross. Not only were they hurling insults to Jesus, but he's getting it from both sides of him. One thief on the left, one thief on the right. 
Now, what were they saying to Jesus? Well, they were saying the same thing that the people were saying to him. They were ridiculing. They were mocking him. I mean, the verse 39 says, those who pass by blasphemed him. That word blasphemy means to insult. So those robbers also hurled insults towards the Lord Jesus because that's what they heard the people in the crowd were doing. They just joined in with the crowd. Verse 40 says, they were saying to Jesus, you who destroyed the temple and built it three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from that cross. That's exactly the same mockery and skepticism that the robbers began to say to Jesus. They were making fun of the Lord's own statement when he said, you who will destroy the temple, I will raise it up. In that moment, he wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about the temple of his body. In other words, Jesus was telling hey, look, one day you're going to crucify me, but I'm going to tell you right now, three days, I'm coming out of that tomb. But they missed the point. They did not get it. So they mocked him and began to taunt the Lord Jesus to come down from that cross if you really are who you say you are. Then in verse 41, the religious leaders and the chief priests, they, they mocked him. And the elders said, well, he saved others, but he can't save himself. He healed a blind man, cleansed the leper, made the deaf to hear, made the lame to walk, but he can't save himself. He must be weak. And so they kept on mocking Jesus. And so the robbers here in that crowd of those mocking and ridiculing, they just picked up the refrain. And of course, verse 43, it says, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he'll have him. For he said, I'm the son of God. So there were the two convicted robbers saying, if you're the son of God, come down off that cross. If you're the son of God like you claim to be, and if your father would really have you, because to us you look just like a common criminal, you're just just as guilty as we are. But if God will have you, then come down off that cross and then we'll believe. And so they're mocking Jesus. They're actually tempting Jesus, which the Bible says you should not tempt the Lord your God. So both these thieves were guilty of hurling insults at Jesus as Jesus is bleeding and dying on the cross. But then something happened. Something took place. A wonder took place because one of those thieves that were initially hurling insults to Jesus, something happened that caused him to stop and have a change of heart that changed his life forever. Now Luke's gospel records it in great detail for us. Because what we learn from this scene is is that as one thief was hurling the insults towards Jesus, and as they both were doing that, but one in particular suddenly had a change of heart. There was a a sort of a catch in his spirit. It kind of reminds me of the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15 where we're told the prodigal son left his home and he went out and blew all his money and began worldly living and, and, and doing what he basically wanted to do, what he thought was best for his life. He, he was just rebelling totally what his dad had taught him. And the prodigal son pictures a lost person who runs from God, think uh, the very one who could save us. But then that prodigal son found himself sitting in a pig pen And in that moment, sitting in that pig pen, the Bible says he came to himself. In other words, he came to himself. All of a sudden, he looked around and said, man, I am in rock bottom. I have have messed up. And I ain't got nobody to blame but myself. And he made it about faith. faith, And he he went back towards his father. Well, suddenly on the cross, one of those thieves, and we don't know his name, but what we know is that One of those thieves, the light bulb came on in his life. Because listen to the words of Luke. He talks about the same robbers that we're reading about here in Matthew's gospel. In Luke Luke 23, verse 39, it says, One of the criminals that were hanged blasphemed him, insulted him, and said to Jesus, If you're the Christ, save yourself. Now, we just read that in Matthew's gospel. So we've seen both thieves doing this. But now notice from Luke's gospel, we're down to one. One robber's picking up the insults, and... Apparently, the other one had a change of heart. Because listen to verse 40. The Bible says, The other answering that thief that was hurling insults at Jesus, he rebuked him. He corrected him. He says, Don't you even fear God, seeing that you're under the same condemnation? In other words, this man hanging on the cross recognizes that it's really not the judgment of a criminal court that we need to fear. It's the judgment of a holy God beyond the grave that we need to fear. It's not being crucified here on this horrible uh, cross that's the problem. I'm telling you what, what the big problem is, is facing uh, or being cast headlong into a devil's hell to be separated from God forever because of us being an unbelieving, uh, unforgiving sinner. So what caused that change of heart? What changed the way he was thinking? It was Holy Spirit conviction. 
And it went to work on that man's heart as he was, be, as he was also uh, being crucified on that cross with Jesus. Now, isn't that an amazing thing? Those two thieves, they were not in a church service. They were not in a revival meeting. They were not in a, a Christian retreat. One thief hanging on the cross beside Jesus came under deep Holy Spirit conviction. And maybe today, some of you, you may have a spouse at home that has a hard heart. You may have some other family member that has a hard heart. You may have a teenage son or a teenage daughter who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ yet as their Savior. And maybe you've given up. But I'm going to tell you what, if a Holy Spirit conviction can visit this common thief on the cross who was hurling insults at the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet God could break his heart, rip open his soul with Holy Spirit conviction to change his attitude and behavior towards Jesus Christ, the same Holy Spirit could do that for your loved one. That means don't stop praying for their salvation. Don't stop believing that God can save them because I'm going to tell you what, even if they don't want to hear you right now, you can still pray for them to be saved, and you can pray that the Holy Spirit convicts their heart. Let me tell you what, they could tune you out, but they can't stop the power of Holy Spirit conviction, convicting them of their sin and convincing them of their need for Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit conviction uh, will get a person's attention no matter where they're at. It doesn't matter if they're home, the workplace, driving down the road, doing their hobbies, whatever, wherever. When the Holy Spirit of God convicts a person, they know it, and they can't stop it. Now, they can resist it, but they cannot rest in peace until they respond the way God is calling them to respond. And so the Holy Spirit knows exactly how to get a person's attention, whether they want to listen or not. That's the power of conviction. And so thus far in this wonder of the cross scene here, we see this thief's condition. We see his conviction because one thief here under conviction, he's under conviction that he's, he's, he's in a lost sinful condition. But he has a change of attitude now and vocabulary towards Jesus. You see, this convicted thief under Holy Spirit conviction said, no, they, why are you insulting this man? Do you not fear God? We're the ones that are sinners. We are condemned. We're not innocent. The man in the middle is innocent. We're getting what we deserve, but he doesn't deserve this. This man's done nothing wrong. Folks, in that moment, the Holy Spirit had revealed to that thief under conviction that Jesus is without sin. He's the sinless Savior. And that's the miracle wonder of the Holy Spirit work in the world today to convict the lost sinner of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's the wonder and the power of the cross that really melts the heart and draws the sinner to the Lord to cease them from arguing with the Lord, but motivates them to surrender themselves totally to the Lord. For only the message of the cross has the power to save a lost sinner. And that's what our low country needs today. That's what our neighborhoods need today. That's what America needs today. Listen, we're in the throes of a very divided nation in a political war like we've never seen in our lifetime. Now, I believe every Christian ought to be a good citizen and vote when you have the opportunity to do so and pray for those in authority, whether you like them or not, whether you vote for them or not. It's our duty as a Christian to pray for those in authority. But let me tell you something. The only thing that's going to change hearts it's not found in some policy decision. It's not found in any promises from any politician from either party. The only thing that will change a person's heart is only found at the old rugged cross where Jesus uh, shed his blood and died in agony of shame. Because what is it that rips the hate out of a person's heart? What is it that puts love in a person's soul? What is it that causes a mind to cease to be prejudiced? What is it that causes people to really care about other people? What is it, my friend, that really delivers us from the clutches of sin and the armies of the devil's darkness? It's the old rugged cross where Jesus paid our sin debt in full. So look what happens here. The Spirit of God is educating this thief now under Holy Spirit conviction. So in verse 42, he said to Jesus, the very one, he says, he says, this man's done nothing wrong. But then he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, Lord. Now think about that. No one can call Jesus Lord without the help of the Holy Spirit. So hanging on that cross, hurling insults at Jesus at one moment, but the next moment he stops. Because it dawns on him, hey, I'm the lost one. I'm the guilty sinner. I'm the one getting what I deserve. This man, Jesus, is innocent. He don't deserve it. And so he begins to defend the Lord Jesus to that other thief. 
And that, and that inspires me. That Jesus, hanging on that cross, had at least one person who was willing to stand up for him. There was no one else standing up for Jesus. At the foot of the cross, all his disciples had forsook him and fled. Here we see a man who was dying on the cross, now taking a stand for Jesus. May we as Christians be like that man. May we, with all, all sincerity and commitment, uh, lift up our Lord Jesus Christ at all costs. We should never apologize for the fact that we are born again, blood-washed children of the living God, saved by grace. Because it's Jesus who came and died in agony shame on that cross for my sins and your sins in our place. And my friends, we are born again Christians by new birth. A Christian is someone who's a follower of Jesus Christ. And as a believer, I see him dying in agony and shame in my place on that cross. And, and, and because of what he did for me that I could never do for myself, I want to heed his call to discipleship. I don't want to be a fair weather, namby-pamby, sissy Christian, up and down, in and out, hot one day, cold the next. Oh, no, I want to be full throttle. I want to be pedal to the metal, as we say in the South. I want to be whole hog out for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be faithful to my Lord and Savior until he calls me home. I want Jesus to be Lord of every kingdom of my heart. Because I tell you what, when you have a vision of the cross where Jesus died, it tell you, it'll motivate you. you want to heed his words where he said, Deny yourself, child of God. Jesus says, Take up your cross and follow me. Well, that thief under the Holy Spirit conviction says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Because, you see, the Holy Spirit of God had convinced him that there's life beyond the grave. And that you just don't go out to nothing. In other words, when you die, that's it. No, when you die, you go somewhere. And the thief under the Holy Spirit conviction understood that. So he said, Lord, remember me. Now, what caused him to do that? What does the Holy Spirit use to convict the lost sinner? Well, the Bible tells us. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And he heard Jesus speak the word at the cross. Remember as, as they were mocking Jesus, Jesus prayed. And he prayed out loud. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I just believe when that thief heard those words from Jesus, Father, forgive them. That message spoke to his heart. And just ignited that Holy Spirit conviction to convince him that he was lost. He was dying. He was separated from a holy God. And he needed Jesus to save his soul before it was too late. And so the first time he got to thinking, you know what? I can be forgiven. In other words, I can experience mercy even though I don't deserve it. You see, forgiveness has nothing to do with justice. Forgiveness has everything to do with mercy and grace. Grace is getting what we don't deserve, which is the guarantee of heaven. And mercy is not getting what we do deserve, which is hell, because we're sinners. And so this thief and the Holy Spirit conviction said, Lord, remember me. Because he's thinking about Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. And he knows he was one of them that Jesus was praying for. He knows he was one of those guilty hurling insults to Jesus. But he heard Jesus say from his own mouth, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This man witnessed Jesus expressing love and forgiveness. He saw Jesus firsthand not getting bitter, not seeking revenge, not hurling any insults back, because that's what people would do when they were being crucified. They would just cuss one another out. It, 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 was, a, it was a sad sight. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. And Jesus spoke of forgiveness. And as he spoke of that forgiveness to the Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit of God entered into this dead man's soul, met it, met it, uh, just melted his heart with conviction because he saw love being crucified beside him. He saw grace and mercy being crucified beside him. He saw himself as a lost and dying sinner and he realized he needed a Savior and he realized who the Savior is. He was right beside him. So he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Basically what he was saying, Lord, will you save me? Let me tell you what. That's all you got to say to Jesus as a lost sinner. Just say, Lord, save my soul. Well, I've said something about his condition. I've said something about his conviction. I showed you how the Holy Spirit of God took you from hurling insults to praying a sinner's prayer of repentance and faith. But last but not least, number three, I want to show you something about his conversion. His conversion. I want you to know when he cried out, Lord, uh, Lord, will you remember me? When Basically, when he was asking the Lord for mercy, that the Lord saved him and secured him right then and forever. Now, think about this. This thief under the Holy Spirit figure said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. 
Jesus said, today, assuredly, in other words, this is it. I promise, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. You know what that teaches us about true salvation? It teaches us there's a right way that excludes itself from all the other wrong ways out there that's taught. And this particular statement from Jesus corrects every wrong way of salvation known to man. It corrects every false view of salvation, that, that especially that, that salvation is something that you earn or work for. Jesus clearly taught salvation is a gift you've got to receive. Think about it. This man was never baptized. I mean, he was never sprinkled, poured on, or baptized by immersion. He never attended a confirmation class. He never walked to church. I'd never been to church. Never filled out a church membership card. Never took the Lord's Supper because salvation has nothing to do with human religious works. It's a gift from God that must be received. So let me explain something to you, my friends. When Jesus said, today you will be me in paradise, that corrected the false teaching of purgatory. Sadly, there's people that's been taught there's a place called purgatory, but the Bible doesn't teach of anything. You won't find it in the Bible. It's either heaven or hell. Here Jesus said to the thief of the cross, today you're going to be with me in paradise not purgatory. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. What you do with Jesus right now in this life determines where you're going to spend eternity when your life on this earth is over. You're going to go to one of the other places. There's no in-between. It's either heaven or hell. There's no halfway place. There's no, there's no second chance after you die. What you do with Christ now in this moment determines where you're going to spend eternity. Well, in this statement, when Jesus said, today you will be me in paradise, he also corrected the idea of soul sleep. That's the teaching that your soul sleeps in the grave until the resurrection and then it's awakened. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. When Paul talks about those who are asleep, he wasn't talking about those soul sleeping. He was talking about the bodies that have died. The body dies, but the soul lives. Paul says, I'll be absent from the body and present with the Lord. When Lazarus the beggar died, he was immediately carried by the angels into what was called Abraham's bosom, which was heaven. His soul did not sleep in the grave. Jesus didn't say to this thief who repented that one of these days in the future, I'll take you to paradise. He didn't say that. He said today. In other words, as soon as you breathe your final breath, you will be with me in paradise. You know what that means? That means your saved mama, your saved daddy, your saved grandparents, your saved loved ones. All your saved loved ones are not, are not really uh, dead. Their bodies may have died and they're in a cemetery somewhere, but their soul is alive in heaven, more alive than they've ever been before. Jesus says to the Christian, the moment we die, immediately you're going to be with me in paradise. But also from this statement from Jesus to the converted thief, it shows that universalism is a wrong teaching. You know, there are religions, and of course, in a lot of Hollywood and most of the secular world, people think that everybody goes to heaven no matter what you believe. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible didn't say all you folks are going to be with me in paradise. Jesus said to the one man there who was repenting, who was believing under Holy Spirit conviction that you, today, you, singular, you will be with me in paradise. You see, the Lord don't save everybody in mass because every person must individually come to know Jesus Christ just like this man did by the way of the cross. Jesus, Jesus Christ shows us right here that salvation is a certainty. When he said, surely I say to you, that means you can be saved and you can know that you're saved. You can be sure of your salvation. It's not about feeling, it's about faith. It's not faith in what you do, it's in faith. It's faith in what Jesus has done for you. And it's the promises of the Lord that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are saved, safe, and secure, and will see Jesus in paradise. The wonder of a changed life. It shows us that salvation is a personal experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, out of all those throngs of people that were there that day, a whole lost world in darkness, but yet Jesus took the time on the cross as he was dying for all the human race, shedding his blood for everybody. Because remember, God so loved the world. Jesus sent his son Jesus to pay the price for all people. But he said to the one who said, Lord, remember me. Today you'll be me in paradise. Oh, what a Savior. What this tells us is that the, the wonder conversion is a personal experience with Jesus Christ. And it happens as soon as you call upon his name to save you. Jesus said, today... You'll be with me in paradise. 
That means conversions forever. Jesus called heaven the Father's house in John 14. In the book of Revelations, heaven's called a city. John said, I saw a city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. In the Old Testament, we, there, there's some old gospel songs taken from uh, the, the, the picture of heaven called Beulah Land. But to me, one of the most precious words in heaven, for heaven is the word paradise. Paradise comes from a Persian word that means a beautiful garden. Now think about that. Because, you know, everything really got messed up in a garden. Adam and Eve had a perfect garden to start out with, but sin entered the garden in the beginning. And now Jesus reversed the curse of that sin on an old rugged cross. And Jesus said, I'm going to take you to a beautiful place, a beautiful garden called paradise, where there's no more curse, no more sin, no more sickness, and no more death. Jesus said to that man, today you're going to be with me in paradise. In other words, you're going to be with me in heaven to be with Jesus. That was a promise of the Lord. So here we had two men on each side of Jesus, one one on the left, one on the right. Both heard the Lord pray that prayer, Father, forgive them. Both of them could see the title that was nailed above his head, King of the Jews. Both had personal access to him. Both could see his example, no revenge. They saw pure love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness at the cross. But yet only one went to heaven. Because when it comes down to it, Christ is a perfect gentleman. He'll never force his way in anybody's life. God gives each of us the free will to choose to receive Jesus or to reject Jesus. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone opens the door, I'll come in. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the wonders of the cross was that this robber's life was changed at the cross because he opened his heart's door to Jesus. That means if you're lost in sin today, you don't have to leave here the way that you came in. You can be saved and you can be changed. And if you've not done that, let me invite you to make that life-changing decision today so you can personally experience the wonder of a changed life that only Jesus Christ can give you. Oh, what a Savior. We have in Jesus. Do you know him today? If not, why not? Don't let this opportunity pass. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed your next breath. Today is the day of salvation. You know Jesus Christ. You have experienced the wonder of a changed life. And if you have it, I pray you will today. Every head bowed and every eye closed. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and then we'll have a hymn of invitation, and I pray you will respond to today to the Holy Spirit conviction. Let's pray. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, Lord, I pray that you'll put a, the fresh fire in our soul. Father, I pray fires of conviction to those that are lost. I pray for the Christian that just maybe just struggling in their walk to be refreshed and just have that fresh view of the cross today to realize the price you paid so that we can be saved, safe, and secure forever. Lord, have your way through this time of invitation. May the lost be saved. May Christians be revived and refreshed. And may you get all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.